Today, we would like to welcome Mark Shuttleworth to Destination Linux podcast. Mark is the founder and CEO of Canonical, the company behind the development of the Linux-based Ubuntu operating system. And Mark's been the space. Mark, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's amazing to have you here. I think Jill's about to burst yeah. out of her skin. <laughs> so She's excited. so excited. Uh, so you've got a lot of fans here, but we want to start with your origin story. We've got a lot of new listeners. This podcast brings a lot of the new people in Linux into it, as well as the experience. So for a first time guest, want to know your origin story. What was your first experience with Linux? Well, I was a student in the 1990s in Cape Town, South Africa, right on the far, far, far tip of Africa. Uh, and the internet was just making it down through the continent had just sort of arrived in the country. Um, and so as a student, I was kind of playing with, with what was possible. And I found myself a little limited by, by the proprietary platforms um, that were available. And someone gave me a, a stack of Slackware disks. Uh, and from there, I nice. kind of made my way through a bunch of distros and found Debian, mm -hmm. uh, which was very early in those days. Um, and it was missing an Apache web server package. So I made one of those and became a DD. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I, I did a bunch of stuff with Linux. Um, uh, couldn't, couldn't really believe the generosity and the, the intellect and the, the excitement of the, the open source community. It was just such a wonderful thing to be part of. Um, and, uh, and so that ultimately led me to, to want to be part of that in a more meaningful way, which, which led to Ubuntu. Amazing. Oh, you know, awesome. it's it's so interesting, Slackware, and then people yeah. giving out like copies of this. When we ask this question to so many different people, it's always a very similar story with individuals of how they got into Linux. And I wasn't a part of that world because I came into Linux way later once Linux was absolutely easy to install, super fun to use. I was kind of completely Yeah, yeah he's a noob, Mark. That's what he said. I'm more of a noob of, of everyone here. <laughs> And, and I hear these stories and I'm thinking, maybe we need to go back to the days where we start handing out USBs because it seems like a lot of people found Linux. I mean, people way. would appreciate the USB part for sure. But I thought you were yeah. going to say handing out CDs. I'm like, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> hey, CDs <laughs> are going to make a comeback. Or, or I started out with floppy disks. <laughs> I didn't actually have a PC of my own, but I had a key to the um, to the sort of senior lab on the campus Nice. And so, and so, at about ten o'clock at night, I snuck up there and I basically started trying to learn Linux. I was yes. having a blast, and suddenly realized that it was five o'clock in the morning, and I only had sort of two hours to get Windows back on the PC. Otherwise, oh. I be caught. <laughs> so it was, it was oh, the, I love that a little bit of a hacker five. story there. Yeah, right? yeah, I love it. How did this lead you to founding Canonical? So you you got this Linux, you know, on on a on a disk. You tried it out. You obviously were blown away by the generosity. How did that lead you to eventually? I know there's a lot in between, but I guess mm. the big milestones that led you to founding Canonical. Well, so I, I was really interested in the internet. I was interested in how the internet would change society, how it would change business, and um, and it, you know, in the early nineties, mid nineties, it was um, it was kind of the, the beginning of the dot com explosion, right? And the sense of of transformation of everything because of the internet, um, and you know. In Cape Town, I didn't have any money. I was watching what was happening in Silicon Valley, but I didn't have any money and no access to it. Um, and we didn't really have any bandwidth either. So most of the sort of obvious business models were, were, were precluded. But I was really interested in security and cryptography. Um, and so I built a business called Thought, which, which really specialized in enabling the sort of verification of the identity of businesses. This is before Let's Encrypt. Uh, and things made it sort of much more, much more widely available, and rightly so. And that business did very well. I sold it um, in the late, in towards the end of the dot com rush. Um, and so I found myself kind of um, just in this extraordinary position, right? I was very, very wealthy, um, and I genuinely wanted to sort of think carefully about what I wanted to do. What, what, what could I do that would have an impact on others? And it seemed to me that. Um, open source was this amazing gift to the world by thousands and thousands and thousands of people, but it was somehow not, it was somehow not reaching people. Um, and I thought, you know, there must be 
millions of innovators, inventors, creators, engineers, coders, entrepreneurs out there who would go further faster if they got Linux, you know, and, and maybe I could just make it easier for them to do that. I had kind of battled through it um, and Debian, you know, was, was a bit of a beast in those days. So I thought, well, why not build a team that really understands Debian? I was still a Debian developer. I only, I only kind of moved to sort of um, alumni status fairly recently. Um, uh, but why not build a team that really understood Debian with a specific focus of bringing it to the world, right? Um, and that became Ubuntu. Amazing. Yeah, Absolutely I mean, that's amazing. That's fantastic. And also it's it's kind of like, an interesting thing about my history too correlates to that team being built because I started with Linux in the like 1999, but I didn't really stay with Linux. I basically dabbled here and there and I played with Debian and Mandrake. And then when Ubuntu was announced as becoming a project, I was super excited and it got me back into using Linux. And then eventually it, be, it, it became my primary desktop and experience because of the stuff you did with that team that you're creating with Debian. So, I mean, I, I, on behalf of a lot of people, thank you for making Ubuntu. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That we have to pass that those thanks on to a lot of people as well, right? Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure, big, for sure. It's a big effort, both from from my colleagues at Canonical and just a, an incredible community. You you met some of them in in Prague, I think. Oh yes, it was it was fantastic. I also met a, quite a few in the uh, scale event that happened recently as well, uh, and uh, so. When you look at the how Linux and open source has grown since the cre like the founding of Canonical, what what do you think is like the most exciting for you? And also, is there anything that you're concerned about? Ah, uh, well, so first, it's 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 very satisfying to see the spread of free software. I like the term free software. I think it's important. Um, I think open source is important too, but I think the the free and the freedom and free is important um, and, and certainly motivated me to be part of it. You know what I really love is, is the combination of um, modern Linux and Raspberry Pis, right? I love this idea that for, um, for very little hard money, um, a student or an entrepreneur anywhere in the world can get this incredible gateway to the world's knowledge as code. And I think we are we are really only at the beginning of how that's going to change the world, right? That combination Absolutely. of uh, incredibly yes. accessible, low energy compute, and you know, just enormous range of software. The the acceleration curve in the number of open source projects is just just awesome, right? It's uh, it's it's kind of Wikipedia for software. It's just incredible, yeah. um, and uh, I I think. I think um, it's a great time to be into software. It's a great time to be into technology, and it's exciting every year to see what gets made. Um, in terms of concerns, not really. I think there has always been a bit of a hard bargain at the heart of open source, right? Like the Stallman bargain was pretty brutal, right? It was you can use the software, but then you're going to give all of your software away as well. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, necessary. There's got to be a bit of a tough, give and take, give and get there in order to ensure that the the snowball keeps snowballing. Um, oh, yeah. And I think right now there's a lot of, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of agonizing over the relationship between open source community and the clouds. I'm really not worried about that because I think in the end, the clouds actually have a motivation to join the open source community. And I think some of the licenses that have been crafted specifically to address this issue are almost antagonistic so that's a bit of a concern. I, I think that's a bit of overshoot effectively. Um, on the other hand, I'm not at all concerned about Copilot and AI and the sort of training of, of AI on software. I don't think learning is copying, right? Um, uh, it'll take a decade or two for that to work through various courts. Mm -hmm. But my gut feel is that actually it's quite right for us to be using the corpus of open source um, in order to create uh, kind of next generation software intelligence. Um, that's exactly the sort of thing that I think open source is all about. So we'll see. Oh, awesome, Mark. And 
uh, the Ubuntu community is known, you know, for its passion and enthusiasm. How does Canonical foster and engage with the community, and what role does the community play in shaping the direction of the company? Um, well, we have always believed that Ubuntu is bigger than Canonical's view of Ubuntu, right? That that mm. it's important to make space for people who have a different vision, whether that's a different desktop environment. Um, the Kubuntu folks, the Mate folks, the um, LXQT folks. There's a there's there's any number of different spins on on the Linux desktop experience, or whether that's kind of specialisms, high performance computing, or medicine, or education. Uh, you know, specialisms like that. So I think it's very important for us to to invest in that, make that possible, uh, make sure that our processes support people who have their own vision of what a distribution could be for to, to build that within the structure, the superstructure that is Ubuntu. Um, and I hope we can continue to kind of stay open-minded about almost what a distribution is in order to, to attract people who have their own ideas. So I think that's very important. There are things that have come out of that community process that have become very important to Canonical. So it genuinely is in our interests, I think, to, to maintain that dialogue and 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 um, to to kind of keep the doors open for folks. Um, quite excited now that we're reanimating the Ubuntu Summit. Um, yeah, awesome. I hope that, that will become sort of a a focal point for people who who have a, a 10, 20 year vision for open source to meet each other and to make sure that Ubuntu serves what you know their needs. Oh yeah, it was a great experience to go to the summit, like the uh, inaugural Ubuntu summit, I guess, and it, it was uh, fantastic. I wish I could go this year, but I have a conflict, which is unfortunate. But uh, this it was it was a fantastic experience, and, I, and anybody who is in the area and wants to go for, definitely should. And the community's got to be, and you know, we deal with this even doing a podcast in open source in Linux. The the community is unbelievably supportive and amazing and loving in so many ways, and that's the majority. But there's a lot of harshness that comes because people are very passionate about open source and Linux as well. And I know Ubuntu is no stranger to that. I remember that the moment I came into Linux for the first time, Ubuntu was what got me to switch uh, from Windows to Linux. And like you, Mark, I was interested in it from a security privacy standpoint. And uh, I was in Windows doing videos on YouTube about that. And someone left a comment like, hey, if you like security and privacy, you should check out Linux. And that led me to Ubuntu uh, for the first time. So how do you deal with that kind of balancing all of that harsh criticism? Because I know when I went in Ubuntu and made those Ubuntu videos, I got a lot of people, you know, some of those critics were the first trolls to kind of show up and things. So how do you balance between people who are just very passionate and then all of the kind of uh, harsh criticisms and things that, that come with having a very popular desktop environment or distro, it, I should say. It is a difficult thing, right? I think we, uh, uh, I mean, ultimately all of us depend on the courage that individuals have to be different of one form or another. Like any sort of progress essentially looks a little alien, looks a little weird, right? Um, and so the idea that that if one has an idea that is different, one's going to have to not only kind of deal with trying to shape that and, and turn it, make it real, but also deal with just tons of, of um, criticism is unfortunate. I think it genuinely it costs us um, in the community. And I, I would encourage people to, to tamp down that sort of toxicity. Um, when someone creates open source, it takes nothing away from you, Right. Uh, yes. It takes nothing away from it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so the idea that, you know, um, people should get yelled at and abused just because they're, they're, they're building something that's a bit different, um, I think it's really hurtful, really, really terrible. Um, for us, it was, it was really astonishing during the sort of the big push that we made around unity where, where we had the strong sense that the world, the consumer world was changing and, for the first time, free software might have a chance to write, you know, be right there at the forefront, um, at, you know, in your pocket, on your laptop, on a tablet, who knows where else. Um, and we had lots of challenges. I mean, we made lots of mistakes. Uh, I think technically we, we made lots of mistakes. Socially, we made mistakes. 
but it seemed like an unnecessary burden to have to kind of try to do that. It was genuinely a gift to free software and be sort of virulently abused for, for making the effort, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so I think everybody who has a voice in, in a open source should use that to remind people that we can't tell what the future looks like and something that's a bit different today might turn out to be really, really useful tomorrow. Um, we miss unity. Yeah. By the way, Actually, yeah, I was planning to yeah. ask you about it because, <laughs> I, as a personal favor, I'd like to see it be brought back uh, to be like to the main thing because it's my was one of my favorite DEs. There ever. are community members who still continue to nurture it. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I feel I feel very grateful to both GNOME KDE and the desktop environments that you know t- we were able to continue with Ubuntu, even though Canonical at that stage hit a real wall with what it could invest in Unity. It was a tough time. It was a tough lesson for me. You know, sometimes. Sometimes wanting to, to 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 make it happen isn't isn't enough. Um, mm. So, um, so th- th- thank you for the nudge. We, <laughs> we, we do try to we do try to um, kind of bring some of the thinking there to GNOME, um, and you know it's it's um, I think it's good where we can find those points of collaboration collaboration and co- commonality. But who knows? Um, yeah. Right now, um, our focus has been to kind of try and reach some other areas of compute. Um, I think it's very important to understand what's going on in IoT. Like, I think if you really want to enable people to change their their lives and their surroundings, IoT is is quite a meaningful way to do that. Right? We live in the real oh, world, yeah. and IoT is all about kind of um, adding something software driven to the real world. Um, or whether that's in your home, at the office, at the factory, kind of in the car, doesn't matter. Um, so I think that's been really, really interesting to be investing in that and enabling people to do interesting stuff there. Um, and also on the cloud, right? Like the, the whole notion of software on the cloud is, is so different, so interesting. Um, so, so those have been kind of our key focus areas over the last couple of years. I hope to kind of return uh, to consumer compute, and who knows what we could do. Uh, we want we want mm-hmm. that too, because yeah. I when I still to this day boot up Unity, there's a nostalgia like I can only explain it like when I was a kid and my favorite toy was He Man. Seeing He Man <laughs> toy, that's what the nostalgia of seeing Unity is like for me, because that was a pivotal moment that changed my life. I ended up on this podcast. I ended up being able to talk about open source and security and privacy and all of those things. Ubuntu was Unity was my first experience. Uh, in Linux, so yeah, maybe one day we'll we'll get Unity back. No I pressure. Still miss the HUD. Still yes, miss it. yeah, we like the HUD. <laughs> uh, well, this question comes speaking of community from one of our patrons who wanted us to ask you about your partnership with hardware companies. They wanted to know what partnerships exist today, and are there plans to expand others in the future? And by others, I specifically mean a framework Ubuntu branded laptop. <laughs> <laughs> That is such a great idea. Um, so yeah. to speak to it, so today our three biggest partners are Dell, HP, Lenovo in alphabetical order. Um, and uh, we have also certified a number of pieces of hardware. Um, we are working to really build a, 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 a super high quality certification capability. It's, um, I think it's really important if you if you buy a laptop that has Linux pre-installed, I think you should be able to, to use that laptop for 10 years and know that it's going to get kernel security updates every week mm-hmm. or every two weeks and never break. Um, but nobody can actually make that possible today, right? So we're building um, a giant lab um, and we are going to put four of everything we've ever certified into that lab. And we're going to mm-hmm. make sure that we run that, that hardware with the latest kernel, with the latest graphics stack, with the latest NVIDIA drivers, Intel drivers, uh, uh, in, in order to kind of both optimize frame rates and, and performance and so on over time and address security updates and know that that, that thing is going to be in tip-top condition for its full life. So that's a huge project. Um, I'm really excited to be kind of getting that underway. It's got a phenomenal team driving it. And my, my, my goal there is to make people feel like Linux is a just a first-class consumer-grade platform that they can completely bank on. You can now go to, to I think, all three vendors, Dell, HP, and Lenovo, um, and you can get Ubuntu pre-installed 
um, on mm -hmm. a significant range of their of their laptops and, and PCs. And I think that's a huge leap forward. I think they're mainly motivated by the kind of advanced developer crowd and, and uh, data science crowd. Those are obviously very, um, um, very high spec machines, but they also offer um, Ubuntu on, on um, sort of essentially a representative sample of the range. So I think that's huge progress, you know, um, 2004, um, uh, that seemed a long way away. It's kind of amazing that, uh, that now it's real. Um, framework is hot. Um, yes. In far <laughs> yes. the engineering summit, um, uh, you know, there were a bunch of very proud framework <laughs> toting colleagues. Absolutely, uh, and they were sort of the envy of the engineering summit. Um, so, uh, so let, let me see if we can do something about that. For I love it. That'd be amazing. Yay. Yes. <laughs> So let's pivot to something else that Canonical has made that is uh, kind of game changing, and that's the snap packages. So, you, you, do you think that the snap package criticism the community offers are justified? I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff that the snaps do, and I am a huge fan of the snaps in the server side of things. That they make so they make things so easy in a lot of configurations, especially like Nextcloud went from being a big pain to just one command now. And that is something that is game changing to me. But there are some criticisms for snaps. Do you think that there's a credibility in those? Yeah, very much so. So, um, hold on. Doggo. We have hey. a special <laughs> guest. Yay! <laughs> Mark special <laughs> came in. Uh, special guest. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, I think that you know this is the difficulty about innovating um, on a platform that people love and use very heavily, right? On the one hand, we're completely obliged to innovate. Right. If we don't innovate, oh, yeah. then essentially we go stale. We let everybody down. Um, on the other hand, every time you, you, you're stepping up to do something um, significant, it will take quite a long time to go from sort of the initial idea through sort of early implementations all the way to you've polished that thing perfectly. And the desktop is almost the hardest place to, to kind of deliver because you know, people rightly are, are like they want everything perfect in their desktop, and to make a desktop secure and fast, you really need complex integration between all of the components. So the desktop is actually a very complicated software construct compared to sort of a piece of server software, which is typically designed to kind of, you know, do its own thing in a box. Um, so the tricky thing for me is that on the one hand, I, I absolutely believe in what we're doing with Snaps. I think we're making a construct for Linux applications, which will be more portable across distributions. And I really believe this, the Snap, the underlying technology um, that, that Snaps bring, I believe sets up for, for much more interoperability across distros. Um, I think it's more secure. I mean, the, the, the language that defines the sandbox is really, really robust. Um, and the processes that underpin the reviews and so on that go into those apps are really, really robust. So I absolutely believe in it. On the other hand, I think the things that people have, some of the things that people have criticized are dead, dead right. They're absolutely spot on, you know. It's irritating if mm. things pop up and warn you that they, they need to be, they need to be um, updated and you've got 14 days to do it. It's irritating if you don't have all the control over that that you would like to have. So I kind of I empathize with the with the with the um, frustrations, and I understand the um, the kind of origin of the of the concerns. Um, uh, it's again, it's a little difficult when some of those some of the criticism is trollish. Uh, oh, yeah. that's just unpleasant and unfortunate for the people working to kind of create that future. But it's not as though they aren't you know wrong, right? Like <laughs> there are bugs, there were performance issues. We did have kind of like frustrating uh, that the confinement while robust is also kind of irritating when you need to kind of push the boundaries of the box. Um, all of those things are real. We're going to fix them. And that's really the, the thing that I've learned is that if you really believe in something, you have to be willing to kind of walk through that. You have to walk through the troll fire um, and get to where you believe you can get to. And I really, I try to motivate the team behind SnapD um, and snaps to understand, you know, how how important their work is, not just for IoT, not just for servers, but ultimately for consumers and desktop engineers um, as well. Um, 
hopefully that anyone who's watching, hopefully that sets your mind at ease. We're not love, you know, la 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 la, ignoring <laughs> the issues. Mm -hmm. We're just very, very carefully building the absolute best infrastructure for di distributing applications that we possibly can. You know, yeah. the number one criticism outside of the speed, which I know there's been a ton of work to improve, and we've seen that yeah. improve uh, every single release, uh, is the fact that people are concerned that because of the server side infrastructure, that this is kind of Canonical's way of, I don't know, forcing, uh, Microsofting, if you will, the old Microsoft, Microsofting some things so that they kind of have complete control of this developer app because it's one of the biggest things. And I don't mean this to be a gotcha question. What is your response though to that? Because I see it everywhere. It's like the server side's not truly open source. That's what yeah, they're exactly. saying. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's, again, I think it's good to be skeptical, right? I think you've always got to be sort of asking what's what what's the worst that could happen under, under these circumstances. There are really two different issues. One is the, the store itself and the, the code behind the store. And the important thing I think to understand there is that the protocol that the desktop talks to the store is super simple. I mean, the desktop literally says, here I am, this is what I've got installed, what should I do? And the store says, well, I think you should do this, right? So that, that protocol is super simple. Um, and so th they have in fact at various times been open source implementations of that protocol, which we haven't been stressed about at all. You know, in fact, that's nice. Um, I think if we were to make that protocol much more complicated, then you would then then it would be a big, bigger issue effectively because you'd wonder, well, um, you know, is is the complexity of that does that prevent and preclude other implementations of the protocol? Um, the second issue is the kind of control issue, and that's a difficult one. Um, in reality, if you want people not to have to make all the choices. That are relevant for securing an application. You know, so you get a you get a webcam application. Should it have access to the camera? Yeah, it should have access to the camera. Should the user be prompted to give it access to the camera? Probably not, because at the end of the day, you're just teaching users to say yes, and and, and that's the last thing you want to do because then they'll say yes to the wrong thing, right? So there's quite a lot of responsibility that we take on in bringing applications into the store where we review them and say, well, what is a reasonable set of permissions for this thing to get on your laptop? Um, and th that's real responsibility. If we screw that up, then, then that will have negative sort of consequences for people. Um, and there's sort of no way to have a system where you can get software from anywhere and also get the benefits of having someone else provide that kind of review and scrutiny and, and so on. And that's got nothing to do with the source code of the store, right? That's literally just got to do with the digital signatures that say someone that you trust has looked through all of that and right. made these assertions effectively. So um, we we do come back and sort of say, well, should we open source the store? It's a store, it's a giant pile of code, maybe we will. When we did that with Launchpad, all the people who were criticizing Launchpad for being open source or for being closed source said, turn around and said, oh, we're not gonna use it anyway. So I was sort of like, well, you know, <laughs> right. mm -hmm. <laughs> thanks for stepping up when we did. Uh, <laughs> so I've never been particularly motivated to do that. And I don't think the team is particularly anxious about it either. Gotcha. Aww. I appreciate you answering that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Mark, I think, you know, the immutable systems are, will be the future in Linux. That, yeah. that just seems to be where we're going. And you were ahead of that game with Snaps. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the things you're looking to enhance with Snaps in the near future? Um, so a lot of work in the Snap ecosystem is now focused on improving the user experience on the desktop. And that really has to do with thinking about the sandbox that an application is in and how to give the user the ability to influence that sandbox so that essentially they can they can they can ask for their software to do things that on the face of it would be like a bad idea from security from a security point of view so there's a lot of kind of work in the full security stack from kind of kernel lsm type work all the way up to the gui um, to facilitate that kind of user control um, we we're we're we continue to do a bunch of work um, on the iot front um, so essentially making it easier for people to make very small devices that, that do a couple of things um, and, 
and can evolve over time with no kind of direct human involvement at all. Um, so that um, is um, a key focus for us. Um, for the rest, you know, they kind of work. It's sort of yeah. amazing. I, I I worry about deb updates, right? We did some we did some um, we we ran a survey where people let us kind of see what was on their machines, and seventy percent hadn't done deb updates in a year. So Michael would have been part of that seventy percent <laughs> arc, unfortunately. I would not be in that <laughs> we list. <all> work. <laughs> we do all of this work to make those security <laughs> updates available. I would and, absolutely um, not be in that list. I mean, if it said two years, then probably I'd be in that list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> we, but, uh, one of the things that I like about snaps that people always complained about is, is it was funny to me. Like, they would complain about it being auto updating stuff. And I was like, thanks. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's What's exactly what Michael needs. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, we we had a we had a security update in like a bad one in some software that's very widely done and um 90% were updated within 24 hours. Wow. I just I love that. I think that's it's awesome. so good. Mm -hmm. um, we had a I mean, we had a bad security issue in SnapD itself and again, 90% were fixed before the 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 news officially broke, right? So just to tell people why this is so important, that 90% is so impressive, is this is a benchmark, especially in the mobile market, in which Apple and Google and others utilize for security. And it's one of the ways that Android, honestly, has been so far behind from a security standpoint. Not that if you're updating, you would be secure, but they have such a hard time getting people to update and or the manufacturers themselves stop providing updates in an Android ecosystem uh, that are that are pushed down, and so many people are sitting there with unpatched vulnerabilities on their and their stuff. So, being able to say, "Hey, when we released a security patch, ninety percent of the people were able to adopt it," is huge. That's massive. That's a big deal for securing yeah. keeping the people who are using your product secure. So that's it's awesome. incredible how much of our lives is now digital, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and the the reality is that we want to run software that we shouldn't trust. Like, think about it. Every time you see a cool thing, you yeah. know, you've got to ask yourself, yeah. well, how much do I actually trust it? And it was that <laughs> idea that really, really got me motivated to invest in Snaps early on. I was like, well, if if we bring Linux to, to where we want it to be, kind of like just a platform that lots of people use and feel good about using and don't have to agonize over using, well, then they're going to have a lot of software at their fingertips that maybe they should only trust for something specific. <laughs> right. And we need to we need to change the way we think about the whole system. Um, the early open source days, you know, were kind of beautiful. There were lots of reasons why you could generally trust everything on the system, right? Um, and we 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 do some things in that regard by making sure that the system is all open source and it's all built on systems that we trust and so on. But if we're successful, then people are going to be running Ubuntu or other distros and just saying, yeah, I want to run that app or I want to run that app. And that's that's great. I, th I think we're in an era now where there are good reasons to believe that any cool new software that comes out for your phone or your tablet um, could actually target Linux as well. A lot of the new development environments are cross-platform, multi-platform. Um, and if that's true, well, then, then, then you know, we, we need that kind of sandboxing and that kind of security. Absolutely. Yeah, and just the accessibility of being able to put it on multiple different distros is also another factor because it's a, w a way to convince developers who are interested in doing a Linux version, but they're not willing to make that commitment. It's less of a commitment when they have a universal format to be able to focus on rather than a, a different dev for each version of whatever distribution that's Debian based or a di or an RPM that's different between Fedora and OpenSUSE and et cetera, et cetera. Like being able to focus on that is very important. And I just want to clear up one thing. I do update stuff. It's just my <laughs> media is not production. not time, Michael. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> no. Yes, it is. Uh, the media production machine is the one I don't update to make sure everything is working. We're clear, and, Michael. Yeah, I, I just want to yeah. right. <laughs> clarify that one, yeah. that one piece. Aww. Yeah, everything else gets updated. Uh, well, and also I need to move, I need to start updating that one too. But anyway, <laughs> the next question is also from our patrons. And uh, does Canonical have any plans to add ButterFS as an option during install of Ubuntu? 
Um, so I really like the work that the ButterFS folks are doing. File systems um, are kind of life's work. You know, if you if you want to write a file system, it is going to take twenty years, thirty years. Yeah. Um, and I remember in back in two thousand and four, the the early kind of discussion around ButterFS things. Chris Mason was the was the kind of visionary behind it, and I think to his credit, he's still kind of working on it at Facebook now. Um, so, so it's quite plausible. Um, I'm pretty sure that our server installer does support it. Um, I'm, I doubt that the desktop installer does. It would be interesting if you ran a poll and, and got some sort of indication for us as to how many people would like that. We could do that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a poll ZFS on this show and that's three so far that three or three. <laughs> yeah. percent. Um, exactly. Um, it it my, what my understanding is that it um, has improved substantially ButterFS, but that it's still a bit fragile. You know that the failure modes are are um, like uh, complex. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because ButterFS to me is when when it first started getting talked about. There were so many people who were just destroying it when you would mention it, like, oh, it's oh, yeah. terrible, it can't recover, this is the worst file system ever. Um, it was unbelievable. We would mention it on the show and the amount of feedback we would get of people just telling us, like, oh, stay. And then it just, like, changed. And they there was a high development that started going into, uh, like, super speed into the development and fixing some of those. And... Now there's this huge fan base behind ButterFS and I can't help but make the connection between Unity kind of in the same way. All these people beating up on it and then all, all of a sudden when it's gone, everybody's like, hey, I really want it. Of course, ButterFS isn't gone. We don't want it to be, uh, a lot of people want it to be adopted, mm -hmm. but it is interesting to see the life cycle sometimes of open source because ButterFS was one that was very hated when it first got talked about and now people really want it, which is kind of cool to see, I think. It's an interesting way of thinking about like maybe there's just time for people to adopt it in a society aspect of something. So like in the, initially people don't like change, so they hate on it. And then once they start actually using it, they begin to like it. Like the, Unity is a great example of that because in the very early stages of people, they, they, they first try it, the first version it comes out, which wasn't really ready. It was in the netbook edition. And they're b bashing on it. It's like, it's literally the first version and you're saying that it's unusable. And then within two releases, it became like super solid and I used it for years. And then people were talking about how they would never use it. It's not worth it, blah, blah. And then I asked them, well, have you ever tried it? No. Well, then how do you have an opinion <laughs> if you've never tried it? Yeah, Not just an opinion, a loud one, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, coming, coming back to ButterFS, you know, I think it's quite plausible we could add it as an option on the desktop. Um, and I think you're right that that um, both ButterFS and ZFS change almost how you have to think about the file system, and so that makes them challenging, right? Like they 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 feel a little bit hostile at first, just because the things that you normally do, um, the things that normally tell you where you're at, aren't aren't telling you the whole story, right? And there's layers and layers that you now have to understand behind that. One thing that I'd be a bit reluctant to do is I'd be reluctant to sort of build user experience capabilities around ButterFS because then that kind of creates a fork in the road where you, you know, the, the whole desktop environment now is is dependent on on particular features in in a file That's system. That's interesting. So that would that would be um, um, sort of something I have to think about very carefully. So I think time machine type capabilities, right? Backup and and um, rollback type capabilities. They're cool, but but they feel a little fragile if they're done in the in the intricacies of the in, insides of a file, file system. Yeah. So you mentioned this earlier, and I want to bring it back because it's a topic on everyone's mind. And I think people would be very interested to kind of get a little bit more deep into this subject, uh, your thoughts on it. Uh, and that's AI. What are your thoughts on this trend and how do you see AI being leveraged at Canonical in the future? Super interesting. Um, we just had an engineering summit, so we we get, I don't know, five six hundred people to to go to some interesting part of the world, um, and uh, we do this every six months. Um, and um, uh, there's a structured agenda. Obviously, every team is working on their 
kind of focus points and then there's cross team time and then there's kind of play time, fun time. And AI was a big part of that, right? So lots of teams looking at how we can use AI for, for example, in um, quality. So how can we um, understand some of the huge amounts of data that we generate just inside our own labs, looking at sort of big deployments of um, uh, desktops or um, OpenStack or private cloud type infrastructure, um, analytics databases, how can we use um, ML to kind of tune the performance of databases, for example. Um, people looking at, um, you know, this, there, there, there are real questions being asked about the ethics of actually writing software using AI and, you know, the, 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 sort of the, the derivation questions there. Um, at this stage, I can I guess um, it's in, we, we can certainly say that this is um, this is a moment in, in the same way that the internet itself yes. was a moment, right? Like it's it's a profound shift in the, what people think software can do. Um, I'm not convinced that I'd like to be running a lot of code that was written by AI because people are better at good people are better at creating code than than reviewing code. And when when you have an AI writing code for you, you're essentially perpetually reviewing, right? Um, and and our current feeling is that mm, at, at least for the moment, it would be a bad idea to have teams using AI as the primary kind of mechanism of creation. Um, but the pace of improvement is just unbelievable. Um, it's very exciting. Who knows? Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I love yeah. the idea of having an AI check my work because I, I want to do the programming myself. But there's always some project that I'm working on and probably every single one of them I've ever created where I'm frustrated for hours and hours trying to find the one stupid semicolon that I can't find because it's not there and it's broken everything and I could just parse it through an AI and it just, oh, you missed this part. Like that that sounds awesome. You know, and if you if you apply that towards programming, I think that that's a great way of doing AI. People people always say pet pet programming's better, right? So why not pet program with an AI? <laughs> yes, it's there you go. Awesome. Yeah. You know, it's interesting your link to AI and the internet because I've very much made the same connection myself of there there was a time when the internet was becoming popular, but it hadn't been adopted by everyone. Where I remember people at work being blown away by my ability to query something and get a really good result <laughs> yes. back. Yes. Right? Like they were just blown away the by Google this, foo. This, <laughs> this Google foo. And then it, you know, years later, every, everyone was able to utilize it with no hiccup. And when people talk about it replacing jobs and things, uh, at least at this juncture, I think a lot of it's going to be there were also people I remember in the workplace who kind of refused to adopt the internet to utilize it as a tool with their work. Yeah. And they fell behind. And I feel like AI very much at this juncture is something that I think if people don't start familiarizing themselves with and, and understand the right way to ask questions to AI, to utilize it and leverage it, they'll probably fall behind. Um, but I'm not as fearful as everyone else that AI suddenly is going to replace everyone's jobs. But with that said, I'm curious, a lot of experts out there disagree with me and they're asking for AI development to be paused for six months to kind of understand more what's going on. What, where do you stand on that? Well, I think it is different to the emergence of the internet because the internet um, was fundamentally about connecting people together. And it led to just extraordinary shifts in what people could organize and how you could organize um, businesses and nonprofits or, or um, uh, activist groups, social groups. So, you know what I mean? Like we, we, we just have seen the world, like the, 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 the internet allowed us to harness our minds in a fundamentally different way. And I think AI it is not the same. I think AI is um, something of a threat to certain kinds of tasks and functions. Historically, you know, people always found more interesting things to do when there was a tool that made something easier or faster or entirely automated. People found more interesting things to do. Um, to me, it's it's not unreasonable to ask if this is the end of an era. Um, uh, you know, I, I I I really think I really think something like 
the 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 kind of Western consensus capitalism view of the world is an era. Um, everything is an era, right? Sure. So then the question is, well, what, what else might, or well, how else might we organize ourselves? Um, and when might we, you know, when might it become optimal to move to a different kind of way of organizing ourselves? I'm dancing a little around the the issue. I don't kind of want to be out there saying it's the end of capitalism as we know it. <laughs> I wouldn't miss it particularly, to be clear. Uh, <laughs> but I do think it's interesting, right? Yeah. I think um, we should be open to the idea that there are other ways for us to organize ourselves. Uh, yeah. I don't yeah. know that. I don't know that everybody needs to be um, gainfully employed, right? Um, for us to build functioning societies and and um, kind of um, be good to each other. Um, now that's complicated stuff. So I'm going to sort of pull back a little bit from the edge of that <laughs> uh, and just say it's really interesting. Just remember when the Terminator robots come, their eyes will be yeah. going orange, right? And- <laughs> orange. <laughs> that's so cool, nice. Mark. <laughs> I was I was about to ask you a yeah, Skynet we related just- question. <laughs> That was, that was awesome. perfect. Michael wrote in yeah. there. I have a follow up to mention Skynet, right? When <laughs> yeah. You said that there, Mark. So that's, yeah, perfect timing. Yeah. Uh, as, as a Trekkie, I feel like there's got to be a point in time where we get to the. Uh, yeah, why Star- is it always Skynet, Skynet. and Terminator yeah. that the future always holds rather Star than Trek. Star Trek? About the Borg. We can't you know? talk about why, the Borg. Why are you guys in two dimensions and not in a holiday? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Mark, I wanted to get back a little bit to Snaps because something that was so cool is I saw your awesome keynote, Open Source in the World of App Stores, at the Southern California Linux Expo Scale 14X in uh, January of 2016. And there, you made the exciting public announcement about the new containerized software called Snaps. So that was when we all found out about it. And also just a side note, I just want to say that that's a good name for the application format because there's a snap for that. It's just, that was a good name. Just wanted to say that. (laughs) So that was just really, it was really cool. So... Mark, when you look back at all the things Canonical has accomplished, what are you most proud of? Uh, that's interesting. Um, surviving, honestly. Um, if 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 it, <laughs> you know, with the with the sort of heady exuberance of youth, um, I, I I thought, look, I don't want to do a charity. I don't want to do something that essentially is unsustainable. Um, building operating systems, you know, is, is sort of the most gnarly kind of software. You know, there's other software that might be harder in some places and 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 and, and so on. But and there, there may be other kinds of software that require like particular sorts of vision that 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 I don't have. But operating systems are just gnarly. You know what I mean? They're huge and complicated, and everything's changing all the time. And you can only be responsible for so much of it, but you've got to ship all of it. Um, so so doing something as big and gnarly as that. Um, and knowing that um, we were going to give it away for free, because otherwise, why should we do? Why, sh- why should we do it? Right? There were other people who were already selling Linux. Um, I wanted to be able to sort of figure out h- uh, how to give it away for free. Um, uh, I knew that I needed a business model for that. The original idea was was essentially Netflix, Dropbox, Spotify, you know, g- paid services for your free operating system. Um, I failed completely at that. It was just too complicated to build a Linux. We just didn't have time or money to go after those other things. Um, and it turned out you didn't. You you, you could do those things. Um, you wouldn't get crushed by the by the, the the sort of hegemony of Windows if you did those things because actually phones arrived and so suddenly it was a multi-platform world mm-hmm. uh, uh, anyway. So long story short, you know, we found ourselves with an operating system that everybody loved. Yes. Um, and no real business model in about like 2012 to 2013, it started to become clear for me. And I felt a real obligation to Ubuntu users to just to, to fight through that and find find a way to keep Ubuntu sustainable in the world. Um, it took a lot of courage for the team. You know, I think my team knew that we were up against the wall. Um, I had to kind of grind through it. It was very scary. Um, mm-hmm. But I really sort of salute the members of my team, both community and canonical, who who stuck with it. 
Um, and so to get to a place now where we really can say, okay, there is a customer base for Ubuntu. We, we do more and more in the free version of Ubuntu, and I'm really proud of that. Um, but there is a customer base there that means that if I get hit by a bus, um, uh, the world um, can expect others to continue um, with that. I think that that's kind of meaningful. Um, and I'm and I'm really proud to oh, have uh, yeah. to have done that. You should and, be. and absolutely the team that helps do it, right? Very much so. And we all got to remember that Ubuntu four point ten Wardy Warthog was the first ever officially released version of Ubuntu, and it was released in October of two thousand four, eighteen years ago. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it was so progressive for its time it was released. It had an easy to use graphical installer and GNOME user interface that your average user could get Linux up and running with. And it was the distro I could recommend to my students to install and use. And I always enjoyed hearing the sounds of the drums when their computers boot. Right? Do -do 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 -do. Yes. I always love that sound. I, it's nostalgic to me. And, you know, honestly, Ubuntu made Linux accessible for the everyday user and brought Linux to the world. It's just amazing. This is Lots kind of a silly thing to tell you, because I don't think I've ever told <laughs> Ryan or Jill this, actually. But <laughs> it reminded me about the, the the drums and stuff like that. Reminded me that when I first got into, like, using Ubuntu on a daily, I was, double, I was dual booting with Windows and Ubuntu. And I liked Ubuntu so much that I customize the theme and the look of windows to oh. be ubuntu <laughs> how funny time. yeah That's so funny. when i was switching it felt like the same i was like and it's always missing something so i'd switch back and stuff like that <laughs> yeah and I had, friend, I had a friend i had a friend who was like why don't you just use ubuntu then i was like yeah that's a good point <laughs> maybe i should <laughs> Oh, and also, Mark, I actually have a family history linked to NASA. My grandparents were rocket scientists for the Apollo missions. And I have to ask, what is being in space like? Wow. Um, <laughs> it, it's a dream. It really is. Oh. It's, it, it's incredibly peaceful. If you close your eyes, you know, you just have this... This just this extraordinary sort of sense of floating um, that mm. you know it's just it's just kind of wonderful. Um, if you've if you've ever been kind of snorkeling or scuba diving, yeah. it's it's similar but without all the water. Oh um, yeah. Uh, so so sort of getting up there is amazing. The the thing that's really amazing about that sort of experience though is kind of the 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 camaraderie, the teamwork that you develop with a with a crew. You know, I was kind mm -hmm. of. In Star City, over the year before that, working with working with that crew um, under kind of stressful circumstances, but but you you just kind of develop a really kind of tight bond, um, and mm -hmm. uh, you know when I look back on the whole experience, it was it was as much about what happened on the ground as it was about that sort of like that that oh, interesting that feeling Aww. of being safe. The um, other thing that I, I remember really clearly is just thinking that, you know, when you see the atmosphere, you see how thin it is, right? Like if that's mm -hmm. the planet, the atmosphere is like this thin little layer on it. And everything in history, like everything that we've ever kind of like argued about or learned or discovered, everything in history happened in that tiny little thin layer. Um, and that's just, that's sort of extraordinary, right? The rest of space seems kind of sterile. Yeah, um, really made me sort of want us to do better with what we have, right? Absolutely. So I try to surround myself with greenery, and um, I got goosebumps. Yeah. I got goosebumps yeah. when yeah. you I know. said that. That That's, was beautiful. It, it made yeah. me think about the idea, like when people look up at the stars and they feel like feel how insignificant they are. The idea of being able to look back and think about all of the history of everything that we are aware of is here. And the rest Tested by this yeah. little thin, yeah, yeah it's little just thin layer. Oh my gosh, have you thought about going back, Mark? Oh, I'd love to. Um, we're, hey. st we're still kind of sitting around, you know, <laughs> Earth orbit. So, you know, I'm pretty sure in the next decade or so, um, we're going to be pushing our horizons further out, and it would be wonderful to be to be part of that. And uh, you know, one one day, you know, who knows? Get well, old and cranky, people may want to send me on a one-way ticket. 
I know. So, Mark, you have survived our uh, gauntlet of questions, and this has been an absolute amazing interview. But we do have one more section left. Don't worry, it's very quick. We call it the lightning round, and the goal here is we're just going to ask you some simple questions, and you answer it as quick as as you can, the first thing that comes to your mind there. And just to give you an example, how simple it is, the first question, what's your favorite snack? What's my favorite snack? Chocolate. Perfect. <laughs> what was your favorite cartoon as a kid? Uh, Superman. Nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Are you a gamer? And if so, what is your favorite game? Paper Toss. <laughs> nice. A, musin, a musician or band everyone needs to experience? Uh, see ya. Nice, yeah. Mm. Well, if you only could choose one or the other, and it doesn't matter what configuration, any any type of flavor, it doesn't matter. Cupcake or muffin? Which one would you choose? Muffin. Boom, got gotcha, you, Ryan. <laughs> <Pardon>. <laughs> what is the first app you install on a new computer? Vim. Okay. You're gonna make a lot of fans with that <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> I sort of already asked this, but I wanted to just just to kind of put it out there as a big fan of Unity and as a personal favor to me. Is there any chance we could have Unity come back to the main edition of Ubuntu? There is a small chance. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. take it. I'll take the chance. And finally, your personal go-to desktop environment. Um, GNOME. Beautiful. You Yay. passed. You passed the lightning <laughs> round there. Uh, that was amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was uh, like, it was a blast for sure. Yeah. It was a total pleasure. I, I think <laughs> you guys, um, you made this a real, uh, a fun experience. Jill, that collection is spectacular. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I'm so excited to have you on. You are actually one of my heroes in Linux. And I was so excited to talk to you today. She about jumped out of her skin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I found yeah. out you were coming on, I've been planning this whole week. And I have been, you know, using Ubuntu LTS on my podcasting rig here in my studio since I started podcasting in 2018. And Ubuntu is my go-to distro for testing and using new builds and even to, to test uh, some older computers I have in my vintage computer collection. And it is the distro that truly made me excited for the future of Linux. This led to my career in podcasting here on Destination Linux and my work with the Linux Chicks of Los Angeles and the Southern California Linux Expo. So I just wanted to thank you so much for, for coming. And you are an amazing person to look up to. Do you know that um, that's exactly <laughs> why I think it's worth doing that Aww. people people like you and your students and other people essentially can 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 figure out things that make the world a better place. Right? Yeah. So, it's beautiful. Thank well, thank you for all the many years of work. Thank you to your team uh, and and all those you put together, the contributions, the canonical delivered. We really appreciate your time, and I hope. We can have you back, and I promise we won't make you sit here for 59 minutes answering questions next time. We just had a lot to get out with <laughs> yeah. that, Mark. We had a lot for you. But thank you so much for going through that gauntlet. We appreciate it. So fun. Mm -hmm. You're most welcome. Stay well. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>